screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, I have, uh, for the start, I have a quick recap of what, what was the first part. And if you don't get it, don't, uh, don't worry really about this. You cannot learn your framework within uh, one and a half hour. So that's perfectly fine, especially this is, um, this uh, framework is very unusual and very hard to pick up quickly. Okay, so um, as an, uh, as a uh, main phrase of it is no framework is an island, I'll explain it later. Okay, uh, quick about me, uh, my contacts, if you want to reach me out, here's my software uh, email, my personal email, if you want to write me something personal, uh, don't hesitate. And I worked with Vertex actually since, since the last presentation, it's about one and a half year. And now I don't work with Vertex, right, right now I'm working with Spring Boot and actually that changed a lot my original presentation. I changed it uh, yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I went through it and decided to completely uh, change the direction and have a, um, have a comparison uh, because my recent experience with uh, Spring Boot, I worked with it previously, but uh, the recent one is something fresh that I can compare and that, that is uh, very nice. Yeah, so the, the, those change a little bit. Okay, quick recap of uh, main key points of uh, what was first presentation about. First one was about yeah. actually what this framework is about, what its main concepts, and I will quickly go over them. So uh, first of all, uh, the main difference is that uh, unlike traditional uh, Java, well, not traditional, but traditional Java, uh, frameworks. You usually don't encounter this. You usually don't see this actor's model. Uh, the only uh, exception is uh, ECA, which is kind of kind of similar thing, but with, uh, with different facilities. Yeah, pre uh, a little bit similar, but not at all. <laughs> but it also leverages actor's model. So this is very unusual. You, you don't of often see this. And uh, in vertex, uh, actors are named as verticals. So we'll be using this term, but effectively it is equal to actor in general, vertical. This is actor in vertex. Uh, so all the actors communicate only through messaging. That's the only way. So if you have two units of functionality, which our actors are, those can communicate only through messaging, no other ways. Um, also, that comes with one uh, really nice uh, outcome of this uh, communication through messaging only. Uh, the actors, they, well, in languages that uh, support actors model uh, on the language le level, like Erlang, that is guaranteed by the language itself. In Java, of course, you can do this, cannot do this, but uh, you should do this when you work with the Vertex. So actors uh, that you build should not depend on where they are running. So uh, they can be uh, running in the same JVM, uh, just like two threads communicating to each other through any means uh, that, uh, that implementation allows. But basically, you're still communicating through messaging. Um, there comes some optimization for that case. Either you are running on two different machines and uh, those two actors are actually agnostic. They do not know who they communicate with right now. They just pass the message and they can receive a response. Um, yeah, so absolutely no difference. And uh, actor in Vertex uh, is implemented as a single threaded unit and functionality. So this is like a small application inside the JVM application. Uh, small application, I mean, it usually uh, would 
implement several classes. It's not a one class, it's several classes of functionality. Uh, those classes actually may be reused somewhere, but uh, the unit of execution is an actor. So when you run it, it's like running a thread, you know, spawn, spawning a new thread and running it. But here you do not spawn a thread. Threads are already uh, provided to you by, uh, by the framework. You are running, you're executing actors. You are starting them and actually you're deploying them. That's so-called, but you are starting them on uh, on some machine, on some vertex uh, application, inside some vertex application. You just start the actor and it, it becomes alive. It starts to live its own life. And yeah, so a key point, uh, a concurrence model is single threaded asynchronous. So single threaded is probably always asynchronous. I mean, if you want to have some um, multitasking, uh, this is called cooperative multitasking, if I'm not mistaken. Basically, some very similar concept that you have in Node.js, not, not similar, but exactly the same. In Node.js, in microcontrollers, if you ever uh, worked uh, with something like that, you have one thread and you share its resources. You divide your uh, code into small tasks. That, that's how Vertex differs in multi-threading and concurrency model. Okay, let's go to the next one. So quick recap, a reactor pattern, how it works. You have one thread, one event loop thread. Uh, I mean, it's not one, it's the one that you work with, uh, the one that you uh, write uh, your code and your code is executed on this event loop thread. Uh, they can, not can, but there are there live uh, lots of different threads, of course but those are not accessible to you. Uh, you cannot, you shouldn't access them. You shouldn't spawn it. A framework already, uh, already provides you this facility. So you just write actors and get them deployed and they already, Vertex know, knows how to execute them. So uh, you only need to follow the rules uh, for this threading model. So the rules, are pretty simple and yeah, pretty simple. So all your code uh, always executes on the single thread, on this one, on the event loop thread. Uh, multitasking is achieved by uh, how Vertex uh, just pu puts uh, puts tasks into queue and uh, that is get ex get executed by the event loop thread and other uh, other functionality, other drivers, for example, database driver is uh, uh, is written from the ground asynchronous. I mean, it is designed to be asynchronous. Uh, and the way how it works in your client code, you you are starting the query and do not wait for it. You you switch to something, doing something else, and you say. When the query is ready, just send me an event. And these uh, blue circles here are events. So basically when your query finishes, uh, the database driver sends an event. Okay, your query is ready. Here is your data. Uh, along, with the, along with the event, you receive some, you can receive, you may not, of course, you can receive some data. And in the case of database, database just publishes you uh, pointer to the result that you can uh, that you can fetch, uh, or this is an iterator for the result. In no, it's not iterator. It's actually uh, it must be <laughs> it must be uh, the result itself, or it can be some kind of asynchronous iterator, something that you can fetch and do not wait for result. So that's that's the main difference you never wait for result. So all your code looks like start something and wait for response. Start something and wait for response. Wait for response is not wait, but kind of here is my handler for response. When response comes in, I want to process this with that handler. So you generally are writing callbacks. If you, if you have uh, ever, uh, ever written, uh, JavaScript code, 
this is it. This is basically inspired by Node.js by by the reactor pattern. So, okay, that's it. Let's go uh, a little bit quicker. So, uh, super simple. Uh, uh, the first consequence that is pretty obvious here. If you do something wrong in your code and you slip, for example, you slip the thread, uh, start slipping in thread, or you block something, the event loop thread gets blocked. Tasks are not fetched from, uh, from the queue and everything just gets stuck. All those uh, events that you receive from uh, some drivers will just uh, queue up here in the queue. They will be adding, they'll be added to the queue. Queue will be growing and nothing happens. So uh, the first uh, rule mm, that actually everything is built upon this rule. You, you should never block the event loop th thread. Never. Uh, yeah. So first, do not block it. Second, uh, as a consequence, your tasks are better to be as short uh, as short as possible. Uh, that leads to fair sharing of resources. For example, um, the same you have on the microcontrollers. If you uh, if you start doing something. Uh, and not share this process in time with some some uh, other um, some other activity. That activity activity just waits waits for resources. So if you uh, if you split your code into big tasks, uh, probably they do not they won't be uh, getting fair amount of processing time of CPU time. So. Uh, you should keep them as short as possible. Uh, computational tasks. There, there is a uh, one note here. Uh, no, there is no sense to try to parallelize computational tasks. It already parallelized for you. Vertex uh, achieves this. Uh, I mean, it's it's uh, it's. How it's called Cooper, it's cooperative multitasking, as I said. So there is no parallelism. There is just uh, multitasking co uh, cooperation. So um, that's why there is no uh, no sense to parallelize it. If you try to parallelize it, you will just end up with classic uh, application, and you won't gain gain anything. Uh, because computational tasks, they still eat your CPU. That's the point. They're not sleeping. Uh, they're not uh, just waiting for something. So you will be wasting resources. Uh, so computational tasks are better be as small as possible. Uh, if... Uh, Okay, if, uh, as I touched this, if uh, you are, you must use some uh, code that is not asynchronous, that has blocking calls, you have to do this on the separate thread pool. Okay, it's not a problem. You can call some blocking code, but do not do this on event loop thread because you cannot block it. So push your work uh, with the blocking calls to some, uh, some thre other thread pool. Uh, actually, Vertex already provides you. It's called worker pool. Um, basically, just a regular fixed size pool uh, with some bells and whistles uh, built around uh, monitoring. Um, and that's probably it. Just uh, added monitoring. So you can monitor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it also allows some. Um, you can stack your tasks, or you can run them in parallel in worker pool. So basically just a, just a regular uh, pool. That's important. It's not the event loop thread. So you can push blocking calls there. And in other cases, if you have an, an option, you better use asynchronous version. 
by the way, feel free to interrupt me <laughs> if something isn't clear. Or... Okay, let's move on. Um, and as I've mentioned, uh, actor model, I mean, in general, in theory, uh, it works by uh, sending messages. So in Vertex, there is a special uh, implementation of that. It's called the event bus that uses um, distributed some in memory distributed grid. Uh, actually, actually, I don't know really. I mean, I never bothered with it. Uh, out of the box, it works on top of Hazelcast. And um, yeah, it's just implementation with a custom protocol, something like that. You just use it like you're using Kafka, for example. You don't know what's the protocol there, right? So here's something something like that, but it comes with a different concept. Uh, it's not similar to Kafka or uh, message queues. Um, first thing that is clearly uh, stated is there is no guaranteed delivery. So sometimes um, messages can fail. Uh, delivery of the message can fail and you should be prepared for that this is this may come out of um, non-reliable network and i do believe that this is this is something they uh, decided just to implement it through some um, either multicasting messages or maybe udp i don't know but i do feel that this is something the implementation specific and anyway that happens Sometimes delivery can fail. Uh, all you can do, um, you should just be prepared for that. So either retry mechanism or uh, quick failure, uh, circuit breakers, all the stuff you usually do with microservices. So uh, as my last point states, uh, failures may happen not only because of this delivery uh, non-reliability, I mean, of the network. The SOC actually can help, can happen because of something just is restarting or something uh, went down for an hour. It happens recently, <laughs> recently we had, um, uh, on the project I'm working now, recently we had that in prod for, for an hour in prod, it was down because the cloud provider, well, they had a network failure. So that happens and your code in general, when you're working, when you write in micro, when you work in the microservices, in general, your code should be prepared for failures. Okay, let's move on. And here we come finally to the important part, <laughs> not important, uh, the new, the new information. So that's where we landed last meeting, and this is uh, this is our uh, next part. I want to compare Spring Boot. Uh, with Vertex, and with my recent experience, that was that would be especially fresh. <laughs> kind of, I see, I greatly see, uh, I see clearly great points that Vertex provides and great points that Spring Boot provides, and where uh, those frameworks shine and where they uh, cause you uh, troubles. Okay. First thing first, uh, what is vertical? Not from some academic perspective or some implementation perspective, but what is it from perspective of architecture? So uh, if we look at vertex and the way how it uh, uses this actors model, uh, you'll, uh, you'll figure out that there is no something similar in Spring Boot uh, and in any classic um, classic framework, non-actors based, uh, because verticals uh, like uh, the smallest units units of functionality. Well, they actually not the smallest, but when you when you work with vertex, you usually treat them as the smallest units of functionality, and with Spring, that usually is some service, maybe uh, some repository, and that is just a set of classes inside the 
inside the um, sor sources of your microservice. So in your microservice, you can have several uh, classes, I mean, many classes, but some of them uh, are consolidated and some of them are, they can form some unit on fun functionality. Um, I actually had an example somewhere. Okay, it's not here. Um, um, so super simple example. Uh, we often, uh, with, with Spring, we often come up with a data access layer, uh, one or two uh, repositories that are managing access, that provide an access, access data access, I mean, uh, for some entity. Usually your domain, uh, domain model is more wide. I mean, you have multiple domain objects, but for one, you, you end up with having a Spring Boot repository, then a Spring Data repository, then you, uh, uh, you wrap it uh, with next layer. This is lower layer of services. Usually that services, what they are doing, they, um, they delegate calls uh, to the repository, or uh, sometimes they, they aggregate them. I mean, they do several calls to the, to the, to the repository or something like that. Uh, often they cache something and uh, often they can do some side effect in the system that is kind of some audit or maybe send something somewhere, uh, kind of that. So usually, but still it's uh, one unit of functionality which is important i mean for example for managing users you'll you'll have an, you'll be having probably some user repository user service uh user cache service or something like that and all that is it can not be divided i mean you cannot just uh, uh, cut something and paste another uh, in the other microservice it all should be pasted. So those units of functionality, they do not exist in Spring. I mean, they exist, um, they exist not physically, uh, not by organizing something, but they uh, exist logically, only logically. In Vertex, that is exists physically. I mean, you have a separate deployable unit, you have a separate runnable unit, you have a separate, I don't know, separate class that actually wraps that all together. Okay, let's move on. Second thing is smallest unit of parallelism. In vertex, again, this is vertical. So smallest units of unit of parallelism is uh, one vertical. Basically, if you want, um, if you want to parallelize more, you can just add more actors. You can add them on the same machine. If you, for example, if you have uh, eight cores machine, uh, if you deploy one actor that is running on one th one thread, you will you will be utilizing only one CPU. You have seven still uh, free CPUs to use. So you can uh, deploy eight uh, actors, eight uh, verticals. Uh, basically utilizing that uh, CPU. So this is how you achieve um, parallelism in vertex. You do not spawn threads, you spawn verticals, which we just, um, we just use uh, CPU power and don't, you don't bother. Just spawn more verticals, they will, uh, they will consume your uh, CPU resources better. Uh, for Spring, um, that is actually more uh, configuration of the Tomcat, how many threads you want in thread pool, um, or if you're doing some manual parallelis parallelization, you probably would uh, end up writing some thread pools, some uh, managing of those parallel tasks. Even if you are using a Java 8 streams and you are parallelizing something in streams, you are actually doing this. You have a for join pool, the default one in JVM. I mean, even if this is declarative parallelism, you're still doing 
uh, you're still doing manual management, not manual, but kind of you are man managing threads. You're, uh, you're creating tasks. You're uh, ha uh, have a, having a thread pool. Uh, you parallelize the tasks and you uh, then receive uh, the results. In Vertex, you usually do not bother. You don't care about threads. Everything is already provided by the framework and everything is automatically parallelized. And as long as you follow these mentioned rules, where that was, uh, regarding small, smaller, smallest possible tasks, uh, short, uh, sh this is exactly it, and do not block event loop thread, everything works just fine out of the box. So, so this is the second uh, big difference of the smallest units. So, uh, next one is deployment. If you think, what is the smallest unit of deployment in uh, Spring Boot? That is definitely an application. I mean, the whole application that you build, the jar that you build, this is the smallest deployable unit. And uh, in Vertex, I called it vertical, but with uh, some asterisks, 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 because um, that's not completely true. Uh, there are mechanisms that allow you to deploy vertical somehow from the command line, but actually you would end up writing public static void main and writing some code that needs to initialize something and deploy that vertical. So you still need to write some code, but that code is basically boilerplate only. And it what it does, it just, um, it's something like uh, Kubernetes deployment. I mean, you just describe how many what stuff and how many of it you do you want, what rules are there and so on. So it just describes options. So that's why I said that this is vertical. However, physically you'll be de deploying just exactly the same jar, uh, jar, Java jar, I mean, Java application through a jar. Okay, that's, that's pretty important. Uh, we'll see this later, how that comes into play. And that actually uh, plays very, really, big role. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is the smallest unit the unit of static scalability. Okay, uh, this is something that sounds awkward and probably, probably wrong. There is no such thing as static or dynamic scalability. This is something I uh, invented myself or not invented. I, I just needed some phrase to, um, to distinguish between two things. First thing is what is static scalability is uh, described here. So probably you would need some code to adapt your allocated resources when your application starts. Uh, I mean, if you're starting on a such beefy machine like 32 CPUs and uh, 128 gigs of RAM, you probably would uh, would size your threads pool, thread pools high, um, differently rather than you started on such uh, low spec machine. I mean, in Spring Boot, in classic, classic way. Uh, and that is something that is defined on the startup. Or this can be actually not uh, discovered by the application itself, but rather uh, uh, hard coded in the, in the Kubernetes configuration. Uh, that's also uh, pretty, pretty, pretty equal. It's pretty same, pretty the same. I mean, when your application started, it already uh, consumed that resources, it already allocated. So no dynamic resizing happens later. That's important difference. So here we also have vertical as the smallest unit, the smallest unit, unit of static scalability, how that works. For example, uh, you are starting your application, you are writing your public void main, and you have you are uh, noticing that you are running on two CPU machines. You then have uh, to provide some Kuber uh, Kubernetes configuration, read it and um, vertex, try to adapt and so on. So you uh, not trying to adapt. You then have to write it in Kubernetes, uh, hard coded. You actually can write some uh, deployment code that. Uh, that uh, 
configures uh, that adapts your application per uh, uh, per available resources. Uh, yeah, that's code. <laughs> it's not uh, technically it's not part of the deployment, but logically it is. I mean, it's Java code, but it decides how many. It, it is not business logic. It decides how many how many actors do you want. That's that's all. So in Vertex, there is no uh, there is no out of the box uh, functionality for that. Unfortunately, it's a pretty low level framework, and uh, the rules how uh, the rules which you want to use uh, to um, define how many actors do you want for this particular run uh, is something that you should implement yourself, unfortunately. Um, so with the spring, uh, that's kind of it, but uh, there are lots of stuff that just is already uh, made configurable for you through configuration. So usually that is also, uh, it also needs some, um, some, some code. This is not something that happens automatically. Yeah, it needs, it needs code sometimes, but uh, in my experience, this is much more friendly usually. So, and often it's not something you should actually ever you should you ever bother about so uh, more often it goes to <laughs> devops uh, uh, shoulders but with vertex unfortunately you have to understand how many verticals you need you need for this particular uh, machine for this particular deployment or something like that and the last one is a dynamic scalability is basically out, uh, auto scaling uh, that you get by uh, from Kubernetes, and uh, both in both cases this is an application because uh, Vertex uh, was started pretty long time ago, and that was started uh, before the Kubernetes. I don't know, maybe even designed, but definitely much uh, long time before it became popular. So they invented something like that themselves and uh, after some time, uh, starting from some version, they kind of abandoned it, abandoned it and it is not, not, not suggested. You can try to use it, but in general, you better stick to Kubernetes. I mean, it, if you want to uh, be compatible with uh, tools that uh, everyone is compatible, you better not use that functionality. So that's why you usually uh, you usually should uh, add any deployment code on this level, uh, not here. Here is uh, Kubernetes. Uh, territory, Kubernetes territory for both just just exactly the same. Uh, okay, this I've already explained. So next one. So for now, it all looks like uh, what we have, we have uh, uh, with Vertex, we have microservice of smaller units of functionality, which really, <laughs> which really sound like you have anti-pattern uh, that is called nano services. Uh, and that's not true and is true uh, at, one, uh, at, at the same time. Uh, uh, this is true uh, uh, logically, yes. You have smaller units inside, uh, inside a bigger unit. You kind of, you end up uh, writing uh, two small microservices. That's it, right. But, uh, the huge difference in is uh, in nature of microservices. Microservices, uh, very important uh, part of its nature. Nature is uh, deployment, and microservice, by definition, should be a single unit of deployment. However, with uh, Vertex and its actors, units of deployments are actors. So technically, you're 
you you just have the mechanism to be able to manage manage nana services i mean there is not uh, there is nothing wrong yeah it feels like uh, you end up with a, this anti anti pattern but that's not uh, completely not true exactly because of this example that that i shown you you cannot just uh, grab this part and deploy it separately you should you should you you must uh, add a uh, rest api or grpc api api do it you must uh, create a deployment for this with the vertex that's not true you just grab one vertical and deploy it somewhere else kind of that yeah so um, what is important it's a uh, vertex application is a set of verticals so it's microservice consistent consistent of nana services that's right but uh, those nana services they are themselves independent small ones uh, units of deployment which is very important and uh, again they conform another one unit of deployment so yeah it's uh, something that you can discuss a long time uh, yeah but two main main uh, concepts here it's you usually define a set of verticals that you want to be a microservice that you want to scale uh, up and down uh, at once and you always can rearrange that at any time later so you can uh, uh, take the one vertical from this uh, microservice put it in somewhere else or extract it into a separate one uh, microservice with one single vertical that's that's all you can do this that's no problem with it yeah and here here we have a nice um uh, nice comparison so in Sprint Boot, you don't have this middle, um, middle. I don't know how it's called, entity. <laughs> uh, this logical unit, you don't have it. You either have classes, or your next unit is application. So, uh, with Vertex, you have something in the middle, and that actually changes the whole game, and that allows you, that allows. Nana services to be not an anti pattern in this in this in this particular case, and um, this is something I already uh, spoken about. So, if this is so, why do we uh, compose them at all? Uh, is there something that we just can? Auto scale them independently. Why do we bother creating jar and not jars, but creating applications that consist of verticals? Why not verticals directly? Um, as I mentioned, um, these days, uh, microservices world is ruled by Kubernetes, and that is uh, the holy grail of uh, of auto scaling, of auto healing, of all the stuff that is very important for microservices you don't have that uh invert you don't you, you can there is no integration uh to verticals directly so you have you have you have to have that extra layer of compatibility so uh we'll see we'll see it in an example later by the way yeah as I, as I mentioned, uh, for example, already uh, out of the box cloud solutions uh, like uh, Google Kubernetes engine, you just if you uh, if you write uh, your service your microservices as separate verticals, it's just incompatible with uh, Google Cloud uh, Kubernetes, Google Google Cloud Kubernetes engine. So you have to stick to classic standards to patterns um, yeah sometimes uh, things change for example uh, kubernetes uh, started to support grpc um, 
well uh, there are plugins uh, and ways how to but yeah out of the box uh, kubernetes usually uh, historically worked with uh, rest with uh, multiple connections not a http2 and so on yeah things change but with vertex i don't believe that ever changes so that's why we usually we usually must stick to uh, to those rules okay next one so next comparison is uh, i want to compare one vertical as a unit of functionality with a uh, unit of funct units of functionality in spring uh, as such as uh, services controllers such as bins ba basically you define some bin as a a uh, unit of functionality, unit of logic, unit of business logic. Um, how, how that is different from vertex as vertical because uh, by, my by my explanation, it looks pretty, pretty similar there. They should do the same. Yeah, yeah, pretty similar, but vertical is a little bit higher, one, one layer higher on the functionality. So, Oh, here's the, here's the example. For example, we have a user, imagine user service. I'm pretty sure everyone has uh, worked with something like that on any project, either you was writing it, your, uh, it yourself or you were uh, seeing someone's code. But basically this is a classic example that uh, almost every project is using. So what do you have to deal with? What this user service and probably user service as the as the, as the part of functionality. What this user service uh, should contain uh, should contain uh, CRUD operations. Uh, most probably there will be a caching. Uh, so all the caching management uh, should happen inside that unit of functionality. Otherwise, you would end up with uh, inconsistent cache issues that I'm uh, are actually very hard to, to trace and I recently had a hard time for tracing that though so, yeah it's generally caching logic should live uh, closely and inseparable should be inseparable uh, uh, from that uh, from the from this part of functionality and some some uh, extra uh, operations like I added, I added audit here for some key operations. Like for example, someone is creating um, some type of users. Uh, I don't know something that need be needs to be audited. Something like that. Um, you can imagine any any other uh, type of uh, type of operations associated with the user management. For example. Uh, some passwords. User a user tried to update the passwords uh, too too many times in the row, and you on that uh, when that happens, you have to send, for example, some some notification through Kafka or something like that uh, that is later being processed. So it also those rules are inseparable. They live inside this user service. So. Um, yeah, they are tightly coupled and they work only together. They are inseparable, but uh, they are yet small enough to not become a separate microservice. So they still are not a, not a good candidate for, uh, for, for a separate microservice. So they work together with some other parts of functionality. Uh, but yet uh, still they are inseparable. So in the vertex, uh how you implement it uh, just like in spring boot you would end up writing java classes for uh, for data access layer yeah this is not repository there is no some uh, there is no mechanism like uh like you have in uh, spring day uh, like you have in spring spring data yeah in vertex that my mistake this is basically data access data access code plus business logic code. So some set of classes, you still, you still be having it. But the main difference, uh, you, you will write some vertical that is doing uh, all this job. 
I mean, that is doing caching, uh, managing uh, users and so on and so on, and doing database operations. And the main difference is verticals provide a messaging interface. So that means uh, that it can be deployed separately, it can be scaled separately, and still all the rest of the system do not depend on it. I mean, how you deploy it, where you deploy it, and so on. All that matters is this message interface. As long it, uh, as this vertical supports it, you're good to go. Uh, with Spring Boot, yeah, just set of classes. Um, not actually, you can put them in separate package probably, but physically, physically you cannot separate them somehow. So with Vertex you can. You can actually um, build that as a separate jar even and pull the jar when you want, pull the jar in application when you want this vertical. So as simple as, as this. Next one. So how, how, the, uh, how the invocation uh, within the same application looks like when Spring and uh, Vertex. Uh, in Spring, this is just method invocation, for example, from con controller. Uh, from your current controller le level, you are accessing uh, business logic level just by calling method. Um, that is true for any type of controller. For example, if you have a controller that is running, um, is providing a gRPC interface, uh, it still ends up calling the same exact method, uh, just like your uh, REST controller. Uh, for example, um, uh, last week, uh, not last week, a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a really nice example when uh, at, at the last minute for, uh, for small utility microservice, um, we decided to not provide do not, and to, to not bother with uh, API because of the configuration and stuff you need to, uh, uh, because of the DevOps work associated, we decided to uh, to communicate with uh, this microservice, not through API, but through um, um, message queue. Uh, this is uh, on, on Google Cloud message queue. And uh, still there are two separate controllers there, uh, they support basically the same interface. I mean, they accept the same format of data, but the business layer uh, was not changed at all. So the business layer provides a uh, Java interface. Uh, I mean, Java interface on the Java GVM invocation level uh, for all the upper services. So. This is very similar to what we have in uh, actors model. Actors also, they provide interface, but that interface is messaging interface. And that is very different because in Java, uh, not in Java, in Spring, you cannot just pick your business layer and uh, cut it and paste in some other service. You cannot uh, invoke them directly. Uh, there is, you would need some mechanism. Either it, it should be Kafka, REST, uh, whatever. Uh, somehow you would need to call it and somehow you would need to add that mechanism. In Vertex, that comes out of the box. Um, it just event bus messages. The, the same old event bus messages that you were using for uh, always. Okay, next one. So. Uh, what you do when you need uh, invocation from different applications. Um, as clearly for Spring, this is, as I mentioned, you need some, uh, some mechanism for uh, calling. One of it is RMI, for example, which is, uh, which is closer to method invocation, but still it's uh, not such thing. You still have to do uh, lots of work. Uh, to just uh, copy and uh, just cut something and paste into uh, different microservices. 
Uh, so uh, that's why it, uh, this RMI is not here, but rather here. Um, um, yeah, for the for the vertex, for the vertex, uh, again, it's exactly the same event bus message invocation. Uh, but uh, I uh, left a plus mark here because you're not uh, confined to that. You, you still can do REST, you still, still can do Kafka message. You, you're not, uh, not obliged to event bus. If you want uh, two verticals to communicate through Kafka because of that non-guaranteed event bus message delivery, you can do that. Uh, Kafka is guaranteed, Kafka allows storage, Kafka has uh, query language. Uh, you can do that. So it really depends. Uh, it's important to, to understand that event bus messaging is a much lower layer uh, type of communication, low, low, lower level type of communication than uh, REST communication or Kafka. It, it is much closer uh, semantic semantically much closer to direct method invocation but uh, yeah it's somewhere in between it it uh, it is level higher than direct method invocation but level below uh, the rest and kafka and message queuing and so on yeah so that's why here is plus you have more options but you have still default option and what important all of those options still do not still allow you to deploy verticals um, however you want to compose them however you want okay the next one um yeah how you change uh resource allocations and that is something not available in spring uh that's why that's why exactly microservices are coming uh when when exactly microservices come come into play uh, one of the uh, if you go to classic i don't know uh, benefits and cons of using something uh, not something of using microservices architecture you will uh, in one of the first lines of the benefits you will see that uh, you compared to monolithic application, now you can scale uh, different parts of functionality independently. I mean, if you have, uh, if you have some part functionality that is a hotspot for your application that a 99, maybe 95% of your traffic goes through this, through this one, uh, if you separate it in, if you cut it off into a separate microservice, you can scale it, um, independently of the rest of your application. And there is, uh, yeah, you have to do that manually. There is nothing that Spring allows you out of the box to do that. Um, I mean, you, you, if you have application, and let's imagine that it's like microservice and you identify that this, uh, this, for example, user service uh, needs much more resources uh, than all the rest. All the rest is kind of 10% of the traffic. 90% is this user service. You have to manually cut and paste it uh, into a new microservice. You have to create this new microservice and so on and so on and so on. So mm, there is nothing that framework uh, gives you to do that so that's always uh, boils down to a nice uh, nice architecture nice clean code uh, that just allows you to do that actually that's often not the case and the longer the project leaves the worse code becomes and often that cutting off some part of functionality into a separate microservice becomes a real pain. And that's not as easy as I described, just kind of cut and paste. No, that's usually, you need to do a lot of refactoring. You'd need to do 
um, uh, write lots of adapters, you need to uh, add some uh, extra layer. I mean, uh, now you don't directly call that, but you call that through Kafka or through um, through REST API and so on. So uh, the the older the project, the more painful this process is, and Sprint doesn't have anything to to give you. Uh, in contrast, Vertex is this, because of the again because of this actor model, it is ready to do that uh, just by design. Of course, if you didn't mess up, if you didn't write the whole whole microservice as a huge, 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 huge vertical, all the logic is inside one vertical. If that's the, the case, yeah, you are you are in the same position as Spring Boot. However, if you follow uh, follow the concepts of Vertex and organize your application as verticals, you don't have that problem at all. You always can rearrange them. Yeah, that's exactly the case. If you have user service vertical and you at some point uh, your um, production data changes and users, not users, but some data access pattern changes and now uh, much more traffic goes through this vertical, you can just increase the number of it. Uh, I mean, auto scale and that's it. Mm. You can actually um auto scale and change yeah you you can you can do whatever you want what you think what you can think of different ways of rearranging you can do that yeah that's that's by the way uh, extremely important uh, important difference that i've noticed uh, when i switched uh, back to spring boot um and this is I've just talked about, but now from the different perspective from uh, extracting exactly to another deployment. So uh, for example, this goes even to somewhere, somewhere I don't know, somewhere far and to another team, for example, still you have to do that code change with Spring. No way uh, framework allows that. And with the uh, vertex, yeah, you can do that, but probably you have to um, change app initialization code, which you don't have um, out of the box solution, which you written yourself, but yeah, it's still uh, initialization code, deployment code, so it's boilerplate code. Okay, let's move on. And uh, let's now talk about uh, communications. So this is generally a very small, uh, small um, microservices application. Usually those are bigger and I mean, there are much more layers and uh, always there is one layer, the very top, uh, the top one layer, uh, the one that is close to the edge Mm, the one is that communicating uh, provides public interface that communicating with uh, your uh, I don't know <laughs> it actually can communicate with everything anything uh, you can imagine but basically something is public and something is uh, is machine to machine only dedicated or maybe for QA dedicated, or maybe uh, for database engineer and so on. So it's not uh, designed to be accessed from outside. Uh, for example, this second level uh, microservices are of that kind. Um, I um, marked uh, different, uh, different types of communication uh, with different colors and all the blue colors are REST APIs. So uh, here, is we, here is, we have a um, level two microservice that is not communicating with, uh, uh, public, with publicly with the outside world, but instead it is accessed only privately within the cluster. So only, 
only microservices can access it. And yeah, that's REST. You, you still often use that. I mean, uh, lots of... Uh, Lots of projects uh, leverage Kafka these days, asynchronous uh, communications uh, with message queues. Um, I don't know, some, again, events, whatever you, uh, you think of. But REST is dominating here. And not, not in this uh, diagram, but uh, I mean, in the, real world, in the real world, REST is dominating. And uh that's a classic way to do any microservice in spring in spring uh in spring boot uh, or spring whatever um i mean this is this is uh, you you most often uh, are doing i mean you provide you are providing a rest api and even even though this is private communication, only only between your microservices, uh, often you end up writing uh, REST APIs or gRPC, which, well, pretty similar. No, not similar, but I mean, uh, I mean it's it's mm, let's go. There is no standard. I mean. Spring doesn't define default standard of communication between microservices. So that's why you can have that um, different types uh, here, like here, different types of communication. And let's move to Vertex. Okay, so with Vertex, first thing I specifically um, duplicated those uh, rectangles. Uh, to uh, to demonstrate that uh, this is this can be my uh, this is exactly what we talked about a little bit later this uh, a little bit earlier uh, this is a separate microservice but it has multiple verticals deploying deployed in it which is uh, configured which is defined by configuration at the startup so just to demonstrate that and here as you can see, I've uh, replaced uh, REST calls with the uh, vertex message, uh, vertex event bus messaging. And uh, this is pretty important stuff. Uh, to implement REST APIs in Spring Boot, you still need much more effort than, uh, than uh, using vertex event bus so uh, that is great mechanism that comes um, comes in hand when you need to implement private communications but however for public communications you most 99 percent you will you will have to face um, face uh, public world with the rest apis so that's that's not something that uh, is dependent on the uh, framework. So yeah, what's important here? So important here is that blue ones, REST uh, interfaces. With Vertex, you can just replace them with the uh, Vertex message bus, uh, Vertex event bus messaging. Yeah, and... Um, you can have Kafka message queues. Still, nothing, uh, nothing for, nothing prevents you from doing that. So, if you need something reliable, again, something of different nature, you can use it. No restrictions here. Yeah. So that's pretty important part. So that internal communication, uh, I mean, private communication is easily done in Vertex by just using event bus, which gives you lots of benefits. It's especially, just imagine uh, the first benefit, just imagine that, um, that 
uh, this microservice is actually needs a, a deployment configuration and needs a um, uh, in deployment configuration it needs a configuration for the API uh, it needs to expose. So it's still a lot of burden, even though you know that you um, communicate with it only internally, you still have to do that. So you still have to configure ingress, uh, all the routes, paths. So yes, that is more uh, more complicated. Uh, with Vertex, you still follow the several lines of code and just call it. So uh, that's much easier. I mean, and it's out of the box. And what's important, this is defined standard in, in the framework. In Spring, you have no defined standard. You can use REST, but REST is not, uh, not something that is dictated or standard. Generally, you, REST is used, but um, you can do gRPC. So that is, uh, that is it. OK, let's move, move next. So for scaling, um, OK. These diagrams uh, actually reflect scaling also, uh, as I as I have uh, as I already know noted noted uh, that number of uh, rectangles here and not rectangles of squares here uh, reflects those uni units of parallelism that you have, and with vertex you can parallelize them them a little bit differently within your uh, single pod. So if it's a pod uh, that provides you, for example, four cores, uh, you can have, I don't know, many verticals, for example, four or even more verticals for some uh, hot part of your application that is uh, running a lot of code and needs more or more CPUs, but some cold part that is not taking too much of CPU power, you can just turn it down to, something uh, small and still you're running on the same pod. So uh, uh, so scaling is fine grained with vertex. You can you can that's of course not automatically, but uh, per deployment you can uh, scale your verticals inside the pod uh, Fine, fine grain. I mean, fine, you can fine tune that scale. Um, yeah, so you can scale individual subsystems of the app, which is impossible to do with Spring. Or it's if it's possible, uh, it's it is possible by manually uh, dealing with thread thread pools and some, some of that kind. So yeah, regarding uh, Kubernetes, is the same. I mean, if you are if you are using for the auto scaling, if you're using um, REST API, yeah, you can auto scale by REST API. You can use, you can auto scale by CPU usage. Uh, or, I mean, you can auto scale by CPU usage, not, not by REST API. I mean, you can use REST API, you can use uh, classic event bus messaging. K Kubernetes doesn't care. So, from Kubernetes per perspective, that's the same. So, that's really nice thing uh, thing you have yeah okay uh, let's talk about uh, an example application uh, that is an application that I actually didn't write and that is application that I uh, just uh, imagined uh, yesterday when I came up with this uh, decision to restructure my presentation so uh will be uh will be uh will be probably start with a let's check some code first let's look at, uh, at verticals so i do have this demo application i i'll show links uh, links are included in in the presentation you can if you want you can somewhere there should be yeah, you can, if you're curious, you can go and check those uh, demo applications. But uh, today we'll be looking at, uh, not this one, with uh, my books and tools. Actually, as I mentioned, uh, 
you end up you always end up writing lots of tools for vertex because uh, because it's low level too low level to work with so you feel that you are repeating the code and uh, often uh, you extract you create something okay so let's go and see some code okay let's go here so let's explore what verticals do i have here this is uh this is tiny microservice application actually i it's it's not big because this is just demo one so um yeah but i'll try to write a nice code here so we have two uh two services here authentication service and user service okay and we have tools so for the authentication services let's check out which verticals do we have and okay this one is nice let's start with the simplest one so first thing you can see that it extends the class extends from my custom class that is the first thing you bump in uh, as i mentioned sorry dimitro can you yeah. please make it a little bigger oh, okay got you got you okay settings font font come on come on, come on. 13 is perfect Okay. okay, we'll come back to that deployment stuff because it actually much more important than this, but uh, I think we should look into some code and not only talk about. It. Okay, so first thing I uh, had to implement uh, is uh, in tools, I had to implement uh, Micronaut vertical, but basically this is uh this is a uh, vertical this is abstract uh vertical uh with a dependency injection you don't have dependency injection in vertex and believe me it's it's pain uh, i worked uh, in a project where uh, it was a decision to not use dependency injection from the beginning and that was extremely hard uh, no, i mean it didn't start hard but uh, later on more and more uh, uh, single tons manually uh, manually implemented single tons start to add up and started uh, to complicate test tests to that extent that uh, people don't don't really wanted to write them i mean there was so many so many hustle to overcome those uh absence of dependency injection that you you get for free with spring boot actually at this point we can we could close it and go to spring boot and never never come back to vertex i mean uh the just the single lack of dependency injection itself is huge, um, huge drawback of this framework. For me, it's number one. I would say, uh, from I mean, from my from my perspective, for the one who works with it. So I had to implement that, and actually, uh, there is a person on the call, Taras, uh, who worked with me and actually this this is the person who was choosing which dependency injection uh is be better suits for vertex and how to um how to integrate it and uh he was uh, evaluating all the effort all the stuff kind of uh memory usage startup time and so on and so on and yeah so this is something that there us by 
uh, just found the best the best available option um, by uh, let's go by by investigation I can't can't find a better word uh, anyway so uh, it's doable you still have to write some code but yeah it's doable so what's important it um, it extends uh, the vertex vertical so you have vertex vertical you have my custom uh, dependency injection enabled vertical and then you you can extend from it so um, that's kind of it uh, what's uh, important here to note is something that i uh, was talking about on the previous presentation but not uh, not here yet um, classic uh, way, not classic, but uh, original way, vanilla way of writing uh, vertex code is through callbacks, just like in JavaScript, that callback hell when you end up with spaghetti code. So that's why um, these days people are using uh, uh, Eric's Java or uh, Reactor and vertex has um, has mechanism to generate the code uh, based on its uh, vanilla APIs that are callback based. It generates, uh, you just add one more dependency in, in your POM, Rx. Okay, it's not here, it's in tools. Uh, yeah, it's in tools, Rx. Uh, yeah, you add this dependency. Uh, as of now, it supports only Rx Java. It doesn't support Reactor in this way, but actually it supports Reactor in another way, another set of APIs. But more uh, more widely covered, I don't know how it's called, more widespread uh, integration is with Rx Java, which is basically almost the same with the reactor. It has some uh, benefits in one place, some drawbacks in another. So yeah, they are basically similar. Not Rx Java 1. Rx Java 1 is much more uh, worse in terms of uh, API, in terms of interfaces, and in terms of performance. So yeah, we're talking about Rx Java 2. So what this is doing, it uh, this dependency, uh, it uh, adds, uh, I believe, annotation processor, probably, I actually don't know, have no idea, but uh, yeah, it's annotation, I realized. Uh, all the classes in Vertex that allow, allow a generation of some code, okay. I'm wrong here. I won't be assuming. I don't know. Um, not don't know. I don't don't remember where to look at. Uh, usually they are marked with special annotations, something like generation available or something like that. And any uh, vertex generator can uh, hook up into the process and generate some extra code. So this is what happening here. Here we have a generated class that is. Uh, um, Rx Java enabled, and if we look uh, look at this class, we can see that it has default methods, stop and stop vertical, basically two methods, nothing, much, nothing, not much you can do, and it has generated ones, uh, two generated ones, uh, so called Rxified. Uh, Rx Java generated, I'll be calling them. So they are basically the same, the same version of both, uh, of both those. So if you if you watch closely to uh, the method method signature here, um, uh, what you're passing, you're passing some object here that you want to uh, to some operation, and when this operation is finished, you want this object be marked as completed. So 
these are vertex futures. This is not Java futures. Uh, great difference is that vertex futures are not, not blocking. There are just no such method that where you can uh, call, blo uh, call blocking get on it. There is no such thing. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the pattern. And all the methods actually follow this pattern. I mean, all the methods in vertex uh, vertex library libraries follow this pattern. You have some some action that uh, method that you want to call, and you need to pass either callback or this uh, non-blockable future, which are pretty interchangeable and. Uh, callback is like a stripped down, it's just a callback. Future is a callback plus lots of bells and whistles. And what's important is it allows composition, but generally there is even, even official official suggestion from the, uh, from this guy. Yeah, from this guy, <laughs> from the author. Uh, do not use it because it's pretty low level and for big projects, a better use Rx Java, <laughs> so that's even solution uh, official solution from uh, from the main developer here. Yeah, you can still use that. There is no any problem, but uh, when the code grows, better go with Rx Java. Sorry, Dmitro. Sorry yep. for interrupting you again. I wanted to give you a heads up that we have only like a little more than five minutes left. Maybe okay. you can give some pointers, you know, so people can dive into okay. your application later. Thanks. Super. Super. So uh, then super quick. Uh, I suggest using Rx Java, and this is my opinionated way of doing this. Actually, you would end up with some opinionated way of using Vertex, and this is mine. I added dependency injection. I uh, used uh, Rx Java everywhere because it becomes a breath uh, to use Rx Java. And what I implemented, I did some managing of so-called application context. Basically, this is a dependency injection uh, entry point or something like that. I don't want to fall into details. But anyway, uh, through this stuff, you can integrate Vertex with, uh, with a Micronaut dependency injection. By the way, Micronaut is a separate framework on its own. but uh, it's a framework on its own, but it has a uh, dependency injection um, functionality as a separate uh, separate one. So um, you can use dependency injection from Micronaut in any other project without using Micronaut. That's the point. And that's exactly what, uh, what I'm using here. Thank you, Taras. <laughs> uh, OK, so yeah, it actually has lots of stuff here because of the thread safety. I had to do this once. I had to write it carefully and now just rely on it. And what we have here, not here, what we have, which vertical we were using, uh, super simple one, db, it was db. Okay, this one. So super simple. Let's look at to uh, do start method. This one is called by uh, my custom implementation, my custom tooling. So what you want, what you need, you need to provide as a result completable. That just is a synchronous way of doing uh, doing all the communication or doing all the stuff. And here we do some stuff and. What's important here is I, read, uh, I register some event bus consumers or event bus listeners or event bus message listeners here. That's exactly what I wanted to show you, uh, show you as, as uh, main concept of Vertex. So this, uh, this vertical, db init vertical, I believe it just runs on the startup, probably to initialize the database. Um, Yeah, but it uh, on its startup it uh, opens an interface, message interface, and that is you 
uh, something you would always need to do with verticals. So when your vertical starts, it needs to initialize something, and then it needs to uh, uh, register listeners. So it needs to open the interface. And what's important? All this thing, they happen on the same thread. Uh, we don't have time, unfortunately, to run it right now to observe. But you can, I have, uh, I left uh, links if you want to can go just explore yourself if you want but yeah you just generally run it and all this uh, these callbacks that you are running they always are executed on the same thread that's uh, important important to remember uh, actually one special thing needed to be done this one you have to do that kind of um, initialization to allow that happen to um, to configure uh, Eric's Java internal stuff uh, to use a uh, single threaded executor. And let's uh, let's move back quickly. So um, actually, actually, there is a lot of a uh, lot of conclusions that come from came from my uh, experience. Um, but the one is the most important one is there uh, what i want to say uh, vertex is an island i mean in a sea of microservices uh, framework frameworks that are in the sea of java ecosystem and java libraries that are available vertex is an island because of its asynchronous nature and because of its golden rule never block a event loop thread. You have a lots of uh, existing Java libraries that do that, that block, uh, that do blocking calls. So that's why it's always hard to use something that is not designed uh, from, the, from the ground up uh, to be vertex compatible. So uh, my first suggestion, if integration with known libraries with some, some stuff that you need, you have a lot of, is vital, it would require substantial effort. Uh, so that is something that should be considered on the very beginning. Uh, again, Sprint Boot is perfect choice. Mm, yeah. Um, second thing, uh, you won't be able to follow uh, rule of Bob Martin of Uncle Bob that do not depend on the framework because Vertex dictates a threading model. All your uh, all your business logic is if you start using Vertex, all your business logic is tightly coupled to this single threaded asynchronous callback based uh, uh, type of interface. And if you want to uh, move, just uh, pick your domain and try to move to Spring Boot, you won't be, you won't be able to do that. Believe me, this is, uh, this is so. Um, so yeah, that is one downside. Again, this is all boils down to the uh, to the parallelism model. And uh, and the last one, uh, it's extremely fast. Uh, it, uh, it is number one, uh, it, it is a tie with Quarkus framework. So it's very fast in terms of performance, overall performance, and uh, has small memory footprint. And that is perfect fit for something small and something that you actually plan to, you may be not sure how the system would look like, and you want to compose that from uh, small uh, verticals, uh, yeah, small verticals, and later be able to separate them. That actually separation is a great key point of vertex. So if that's something, uh, if you want, if you have uh, unclear, uh, unclear long-term vision of how, uh, how the microservices would be split up, Vertex is a bless here. I mean, it's a bless. Yeah, it's a bless. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for a couple of minutes of uh, of extra. And thank you for your attention. And I encourage you to explore a little bit uh, this my books. Um, okay. This my books is. Uh, actually has a nice code. I really put some effort into it. And uh, it has nice toolkit that I developed 
myself. I mean, it's not something that I picked somewhere. That's some. That's my vision of how how I feel it's better to use uh, Vertex, and actually, I even extracted it and updated in this library. So, uh, if you are an architect or someone who is looking, uh, considering an option of using it, I highly suggest you to not reinvent the wheel, but try to look at this uh, toolkit that I created. Small one, but I plan to um, expand it a little bit. So, and this one is how to use it. Well, this is not really good from terms of um, that architecture of how I called rearranging of verticals. This is not very rearrangeable, but uh, has a good example of nice clean code that you can come up with vertex and that actually requires some good amount of time to develop, to rebuild your uh, thinking from classical paradigm to vertex paradigm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, okay. Yeah, okay. I love to, it, it, I love it, to talk. Yeah. It's, it's okay. all right. Thank, thank you, Dmitro. I, like, like right now, I think we can actually talk about, you know, breaking some of the pieces of this presentation, even in the part three. So we can actually gather together, you know, the whole community is fresh on the topic. Maybe that makes sense to follow up and actually spend some time so you can describe the application and all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Actually, because, yeah, I, as I said, I wanted to concentrate on this this stuff because uh, this is something that came evident as soon as I switched back to Spring Boot and I realized, right. yeah, this is fresh experience. So this I wanted to, really wanted to share because uh, this is, uh, by the way, this is information that I never encountered. I learned it myself. I mean, none of the guidelines, uh, documentations, books, state this they usually stick to the basics but in the long-term perspective okay yeah thank you Dmitro. let's take this conversation offline i think it's okay. time to wrap up today's meeting and i appreciate i really appreciate your um, talk and i appreciate everybody sticking with us and uh larger you want to give a few words a few words from me uh thanks uh, everyone I yeah okay thanks everyone hello taras if you're there thank you um yeah okay Dmitro, thank you so much uh, thanks for all our watchers uh we will invite you for to our next events and have a good day and see you soon yeah thank you thank you Arthur. Bye. thanks you too